Hello, welcome to Cosmology Talks. Today we have Dylan Brout, who is an Einstein Fellow at Harvard Smithsonian, Adam Rees, who is a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University, and Dan Skolnick, who is an Assistant Professor at Duke University. They're talking about the latest shoes results measuring the Hubble parameter. I uh, probably don't need to say why this is interesting, but it is worth emphasizing that this is the biggest update since 2016. And so they've got lots of little specific things that are included and checked, including, I think for the first time, the covariance between the supernova data and the Cepheid host galaxy data and a doubling of the number of the supernova calibrators in the Cepheid host galaxies. They go through 67 analysis variants inside the paper, so I don't think we'll cover all of them here, but maybe they'll talk about the ones they felt were the most important. Uh, and with Cepheids and supernova alone, they get to an uncertainty of 1.04 kilometers per second per megaparsec and a five sigma tension with Planck. So uh, I guess we've finally entered the big leagues with the Hubble tension as it's crossed five sigma with without combining with other sets. So welcome, Dylan, Adam, and Dan. Do you want to quickly tell us what it is that is described in the paper? So we've been in the process of increasing the data set, but at the same time working hard to control systematic uncertainties. And so we realized maybe a couple of years ago that we really needed to take a deep dive on the measurements, uh, and particularly how the measurements relate to each other, to improve calibrations, improve consistency, uh, so that when we added more data that we could get the, the full impact of that data. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And so the result of the paper is uh, more than doubling the number of supernova calibrators of the distance ladder. That's really, I would say, the rate limiting step for measuring the Hubble constant. Uh, and at the same time, improving the consistency of supernova measurements that are in uh, what's called the Pantheon supernova uh, compilation. And at the same time, improving the geometric calibrations of those Cepheids. That's really the foundation of the distance ladder. And then finally, at the same time, looking at all the variants, all the different ideas uh, other people have had, we have had, are there other ways to analyze this data to determine the value, the local value of the Hubble constant? And uh, well, as you can see in the paper and read about, um, we've uh, not found a way to evade the Hubble tension. Uh, it seems to be uh, at this point about five sigma uh, from our results. The three of us speak on behalf of two teams. There's kind of the Pantheon Plus team, and then there's kind of the Shoes team. And the Shoes analysis uses supernovae from Pantheon Plus. And this dates back multiple years now where Shoes used data that kind of would make it into Pantheon. And one of the big things that we tried to do with these analyses that are coming out is really try to carefully look at how these analyses are linked and, and how covariance works between the different measurements. And we kind of we put a lot of effort into tracing all of that. I, I would just add that from the side of the Pantheon collaboration, there's dual motivations. We're also looking to measure cosmological parameters at higher redshift. So we have a, a separate Herculean task on our hands that we're fortunate that the same set of problems that we're tackling are applicable to when we combine with the shoes data set. If there were only two things people remember from this paper and, and from this video six months or a few years from now, what would you want those things to be? Well, I'll say one thing about this, which is something people may not appreciate. In order to make this measurement, uh, we really need to collect supernova data over the last 40 years. You might think, well, why don't you just go out and you know do a new experiment and measure this again? Uh, the problem is we need to measure supernovae that are close enough that we can still observe stars in their host galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope. And those objects only occur about once a year or so. So to get the statistics that we need, uh, we are collecting and cross calibrating 40 years worth of supernova observations. And so I think this is a very, I would say, careful and thorough job of doing that. Uh, and that, you know, those objects can't be observed again. So, you know, we have to work with what we have. All right. So if you've got 40 supernovae now, we have to wait another 40 years before you've doubled your data set again. Yeah, which is a long time, a long, a long time to wait. Okay, uh, did, did Dan or Dylan, do you want to give another one to add up to two things for people to remember? Maybe one extra thing I'll add is that all these papers coming out are improvements both in the sample, but also in the analysis from what's come before. And one thing that I think we're benefiting from is that since previous papers have been out and looked at very carefully from the community, 
kind of in these papers, we're able to address all the different criticisms and reanalyses that have come out previously. Okay, so the next question I would normally ask now is why did you do this? I think in terms of measuring the hypotension, that, that's obvious. And so that question is maybe more relevant to why the specific new stuff. But before we can kind of understand why the specific new stuff, it's probably useful to know what the specific new stuff is. So do you guys want to now dive into the, the details? Right, so this is an overview on the Pantheon Plus side of what we have been working on. So uh, six of these seven papers are now out on the archive as of tonight, where basically we are reviewing and improving each facet of the kind of big type 1a supernova cosmology analysis. So just kind of running through these, these different components, we have significantly improve the size of our sample. We've gone from Pantheon, which is about 1,000 supernovae light curves, to about 1,700. And we also go down to a Z of 0.002. So basically, with the same sample, you could do a W analysis, you could do uh, an H dot analysis, whereas before, these were somewhat separated. We've worked a lot on cross-calibration. There's a paper that, that just came out, uh, led by Dylan, uh, where we, we make this great effort to cross calibrate stars from multiple systems to improve basically how we put supernova light curves, uh, how, we, how we measure them to, to get onto the Hubble diagram. Uh, we do a full sweep of what goes on the x axis of a Hubble diagram, which people talk a lot less about the red shifts, where you look at different conversions, any possible systematics in group identification or anything of that sort. A related one is we do a full comparison of different models of the peculiar velocities of the galaxies that host the supernovae. So uh, we look at multiple models from the literature and we determine kind of which, which is optimal for our data set and how much that changes H naught. We do kind of new for modeling method to understand the underlying populations of type 1a supernova properties. We uh, look at basically kind of if we are totally agnostic about how well we could do a calibration with cross calibration, how much that would impact H naught. That's led by Sasha Brownsberger. And basically, kind of scrolling through all these, all of them kind of have a 0.2 kilometer per second per megaparsec effect on, on H naught. So we've kind of done all these different parts. And basically, kind of the short story is that they just don't move H naught that much. And it, what we'll have next month is a big analysis that'll come out on how well we can constrain uh, the equation of state of dark energy. But kind of for the purposes of the shoes analysis, the supernova side just can't move things very much. When you say each one of these is 0.2, I guess if I add up 0.2 six times, I get to 1.2, but I guess they're... It would add in quadrature, and it, all these have the kind of a max level of 0.2. So, point, so some of them are more like 0.1 to 0.2. So, so it, it adds up to a, a small number and, and much smaller than the uncertainty in each time. I feel like maybe we kind of skipped what is Pantheon if if that's something that people aren't isn't obvious. As Dan mentioned, Pantheon Plus is an update to the original Pantheon, which was used in the shoes analysis about five years ago. And we've increased the data set to 1701 supernovae down to redshift 0.002. That's an increase in the number of different surveys to 18 different surveys on 25 different photometric systems and 105 different filters. And we're getting, gaining a lot of supernovae at lower redshift, actually, which is good for measuring H0. And they really cover a large range on the sky, which is good for sampling cosmic variants. Additionally, the nature of us increasing the number of surveys to 18 means that we now have, on average, two photometric systems for each supernova that is in a Cepheid host. So that's 80 in total, with two on average, and that means that we're going to be less sensitive to different survey-dependent calibration errors, which is something that we're always concerned about and trying to mitigate. And the nature of going down to redshift 0.002 is, again, that we can analyze the supernovae that are in the Cepheid hosts in the same exact way as that we're measuring them in the Hubble flow sample. And so that's important, especially when we're characterizing the systematic uncertainties, which we've gone into detail in a number of different papers at this point. I guess there were maybe two or three 
ways in which people had reanalyzed the data that maybe gained a bit of traction that I, I guess you were saying you've addressed. One was this possible redshift error, as Dan said, the x-axis thing. But it looks like you've actually collaborated with the people who, who wrote that paper, T Tamara Davis and, and her, her group, in this reanalysis. Yeah, there's been a couple, a few different groups who have kind of tried looking at redshift. So yeah, Tamara Davis's group is definitely one of them. And then the other one was, I guess, yeah, this peculiar velocity idea that, that somehow the CMB rest frame is not the local rest frame. Is, is that what you, you were looking into in the peculiar velocity? Yeah, so for the latter, again, of, of kind of is, is the CMB rest frame the, the right rest frame or a kind of different way, I think that paper put is, um, you know, are, it, are, are we the center of the universe? We, we haven't directly addressed that, but we've looked at our sample and kind of there's no indication that converting to the CMB frame and then kind of accounting for various bulk flows in our, in our very local universe isn't, isn't the right thing to do. And it kind of we see with very high significance that the kind of conventional way of treating peculiar velocities and redshifts is the optimal way. As we've been updating everything, uh, we've also been pushing towards the expectation of a big update in terms of the number of supernova calibrators. These are supernovae that have gone off in nearby galaxies that are near enough so that we can observe Cepheid variables in those galaxies with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we've been collecting these observations for a number of years. You can sort of look at the progress of the SHOES project as a series of points or landmarks really of how many of these type 1a supernovae we have calibrated over the last 20, 25 years. This is sort of a graph showing uh, that increase. So 2009 was our first major uh, result. It was, it was only based on five now that I look at it. Um, 2011 brought us up to eight, 2016 brought us up to 19. And uh, this new release that we're putting out is based on 42. Uh, and this has taken a total of about a thousand orbits on the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's, that's a lot. And so, as I said, that's one of the main updates about this. The other is we've been able to triple the number of Cepheids observed in this uh, special galaxy, NGC 4258. It's special because it has water masers in it that orbit in Keplerian motion around the supermassive black hole. And so that gives you a geometric distance to those. It's not the only way we get a geometric distances, but it's one of them. And then a lot of this data has not been processed uh, with sort of the latest reference files in, in some cases, six years, in other cases, going back 10 or 15 years. And so we've been able to update that uh, processing uh, as well. And so this sort of walks you through the distance ladder and the different components where the data is coming from. The first rung is using uh, geometry to calibrate Cepheids. And so this is done three different places uh, in the Milky Way with parallax measurements, uh, most recently with Gaia in uh, NGC 4258, which I talked about, and then in the large Magellanic Cloud where there are detached eclipsing binary systems that give you a very precise distance. So a lot of the last couple of years' work has really been focusing on the anchors, about improving and sharpening up this part of the ladder. Can, can you maybe just quickly explain, I, pa Parallax, I'm assuming people will, will understand how that can measure a distance. Quickly explain how a maser measures the distance and how a... So a maser is just a spot, you could say. It's just a, a bright radio emission spot. It's actually a little cloud and it moves. So with radio observations, you see in very close, you see edge on to this disc that has a supermassive black hole in the center. And over many years of radio observations, you can track these masers moving along your field that is proper motion. And you can also measure their acceleration, their line of sight acceleration. And so between the two of these, then you can get a geometric distance just with Kepler's law and determine the distance. And then in the large Magellanic Cloud, detached eclipsing binary systems are stars that orbit other stars. And again, you can measure the Doppler shift to know the speed at which one star orbits the other star. You can measure the timing of the eclipses. And that together, the speed and the, the timing gives you the physical size of the star. And then you can get the angular size of the star because these are red giant stars and the relationship between their color and their angular size has been measured with interferometry. 
And so when you have an angular size and a physical size, you have a distance. And so parallax, the masers, the detached eclipsing binaries all give different ways of getting geometric distances. And then the big update here is really in the second and third rungs. So the second rung is the collection of the supernova Cepheid observations in the 42 supernovae and 37 galaxies and the, the Pantheon work to uh, tie the second and third rung. And, and maybe again, just in case people are unfamiliar with the process. So you calibrate these Cepheids. The reason that you know the distance to, or, or can use the Cepheids as a, as a standard candle is that they have this luminosity versus period relationship. That's right. So this goes back really about 100 years to Henrietta Leavitt, although I think the, the basic mechanism was uh, explained by Eddington first. But basically, yeah, these are super giant stars that pulsate. And the period of their pulsation uh, strongly couples to their mass and their luminosity scale. The physics of this is quite well understood. But empirically, they make great standardized candles because you measure their period and infer their luminosity from that. And there's more of them, so... That's right. They're, they're common, so whereas you have to wait for a type 1a supernova to go off in a galaxy, as long as it's a spiral galaxy, you can come back later and be sure you'll find lots of Cepheids because, you know, they're rare stars in terms of types of stars, but every gal every spiral galaxy will have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of them. And, and maybe the last piece before I let you get to, to the new stuff, the reason the Cepheids can't be there in the third rung is that although there's lots of them, they're nowhere near as bright as supernovas. That's right. So, so a supernova is a billion solar luminosities. A Cepheid is a hundred thousand solar luminosities. So, we could see supernovae to redshift one or two. We could see Cepheids to redshift 0.01. Yeah, and there's nothing other than supernovae that are kind of because I guess there's there's stuff other than Cepheids. Maybe you'll even talk about them, like tip of red giant branch and stuff. But I guess there's nothing that one can use instead of supernovae? Um, I don't think there's anything that really rivals type 1a supernovae. I mean, you can measure some galaxy-based distances that uh, either are less precise or hard to measure out as far. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thank, thanks for the, the, the sort of brief background. So, so in this release, uh, as I said, we've uh, increased the sample quite a lot. We've also done a careful job, I think, of quantifying covariance. So covariance is the the joint errors or, or joint variance between what you thought were two independent measurements, but they're not really independent. And so that occurs with supernova data, with Cepheid data. And so we've done a lot of work in quantifying that to get realistic. Uh, well, it can affect both the results and the uncertainties. And so we'll be doing a full data release that involves 10 million data points, including the covariance. So that's really where you'll find the, the details. Uh, and a lot of this work, particularly on the Cepheid pipeline, was done by Wenlong Wan at uh, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, he is the uh, first author of a couple of these Cepheid-based papers. So I'll just go on and briefly describe the Cepheid measurements. So these are host galaxies observed with the Hubble Space Telescope that hosted supernovae. The red dots are where Cepheids were discovered. This is very important. We observe all the Cepheids in the anchors, whether it's the Milky Way, the LMC, or NGC 4258, and in the supernova host with the same instrument, Hubble instrument, and the same filters. This is how we are able to get the flux calibration to drop out more or less of the problem. And uh, as I said, we've observed many more Cepheids in this calibrator, NGC 4258, with these new fields that you see here. Um, and then here are the period luminosity relations. So as we described, the period correlates with the luminosity. So you find the Cepheids, you measure their periods, uh, and that identifies their luminosity. And so uh, the intercept of these tells you the distance to these galaxies. How do we know that they're Cepheids? Uh, well, they have light curves that look like Cepheids. So these are the light curves. These are variable stars that uh, change their brightness. Uh, they have a very asymmetric kind of sawtooth looking light curve. So photometry is measured, PSF photometry, and we inject artificial stars, hundreds of them for every real star in the pipeline in order to measure the backgrounds. These are the artificial star retrievals that show that we have photometry errors that are quite Gaussian in magnitudes to about three sigma. So that's important for compiling the statistics overall. And people often ask about photometry. How is that measured? How do you know it's right? So we present in the paper two independent tests of the absolute photometry. 
that is by measuring the photometry in a different way with apertures or looking at other groups' measurements of the photometry. And then we present six uh, what I would call validation tests of the background or the crowding uh, that is sometimes in the regions of the Cepheids. And I don't have time to go into all those, but I'll present one of them, which I think is quite a visual one that you can see. You just look in a galaxy uh, like NGC 4258, and you will see Cepheids that are in dense, crowded regions like you see in the red, or you'll see Cepheids that are in pretty empty regions like in the blue, far in the outskirts of the galaxy. And of course, the ones in blue are much easier to measure. Uh, you know, you just put an aperture around it or anything like that. But the distance to all the Cepheids from us has to be the same. And so when you compare, as we do in the paper, the ones in the dense regions and the ones in the empty regions, uh, we get the same distance or the same answer. Uh, so the pipeline is doing a very good job of measuring the backgrounds and accounting for those. So our baseline fit then is 3,200 Cepheids 300 some type 1a supernovae, the non-diagonal covariance matrix, really five free parameters besides distances. Uh, and so these are the three steps, the three rungs in the distance ladder, uh, geometry calibrate Cepheids, 42 Cepheid calibrations of supernovae, and then in the Hubble flow. And this is that non-diagonal covariance matrix that describes the interdependencies between uh, Cepheid measurements, uh, supernova measurements along the distance ladder. And as everybody does these days, even though we can do this analytically, we also do an MCMC to look at, particularly it's useful for looking at the uh, relationship between the different parameters, as well as verifying the, the tails really of the distribution. And so what are these five free parameters? They're all astrophysical, I guess. For, well, they're empirical, but the five free parameters are the fiducial luminosity of type 1a supernovae, the fiducial luminosity of Cepheid variables at a, at a fixed period, and then two parameters that characterize Cepheids, the slope, the global slope of the period luminosity relation, the dependence of Cepheid variables on the metallicity of their environment, and the fifth parameter is h naught. Okay. And, and then I guess you do have these 67 analysis variants where the free parameters might be some other subset. So if, if people are reading the abstract and seeing the published number for H0, it's this analysis. That's correct. That's correct. So in some of the variants, we add parameters, but the baseline is, I would say, the minimum number of parameters that still gives a good chi-square. So the bottom line result is uh, we get 73.04 plus or minus 1.04, which is a good fit. It includes the systematics and it's five sigma from Planck. And if you actually look at the samples from the posterior of the MCMC, and it's actually quite useful to look at this in, in log space, so you can see down to the tails really. One thing you notice is the error in the negative direction is a little smaller than the error in the positive direction. So it's a little bit asymmetric. That's because our natural units for the measurement are actually log H naught, not, or really five log H naught, not H naught. So therefore, in H naught space, the error is a little smaller. So it's, it's a little less than one uh, towards the uh, Planck direction. And then here are samples from the Planck chains from 2018. And so we are really are quite a ways from, uh, from that. And so the improvement here is one kilometer per second versus 1.7 in 2016 and 1.3 last year. This reduced chi squared of 1.03, I guess sometimes I um, I feel suspicious when, when they're that close to one that there might be some sort of, I don't know, overfitting or, or something like that. But do you are you not alarmed by that? Is, does that... No, I'm alarmed when it isn't close to one because, you know, basically the, the, the chi-square is a comparison of the residuals to the uncertainties. The uncertainties, like, for example, with supernovae are measured external to this. They're not rescaled for this. And the Cepheid variable uncertainties are coming from the artificial star test, throwing them down and picking them up. And so if it isn't close to one, I'm worried. Yeah, I mean, I guess with N equals 3,500, maybe 1.03 isn't like what I was calling too close to one. Yeah, it's really not, actually. It's about, uh, I guess technically it's about one and a half sigma from one. You said with systematics, do you know off the top of your head what like fraction is random versus systematic in that? You know, it's hard to describe because so we have now moved a lot of what people would call systematics into the off diagonal covariance matrix. So a lot of it is there. And then we have an extra component of systematics 
which, as I'll show you, are really the variations in the variance themselves. How much can you move things around? So I would say we're statistics dominated, but systematics are an important part. So as I said, one question people might ask is, uh, you know, are these three different ways of calibrating the distance ladder consistent? And the best way to address that, I think, with the fit is just to eliminate one of the geometric anchors or distances. So, for example, let's pretend we didn't know the distance to NGC 4258, but we could predict it based on calibrating the distance ladder using the other two and using the Cepheids in NGC 4258. And so, therefore, we're saying what we predict, therefore, the distance ought to be. And then we can compare it to the geometric measurement. And so that's shown here on the left, where in blue is the actual measurement of the distance to 4058 from the Mazers. And in green is what the distance ladder predicts it should be if you eliminate knowledge of that distance. And so those agree quite well. Same exercise with Milky Way parallaxes. Same exercise with the large Magellanic clouds attached to eclipsing binary distances. And so they are all uh, quite consistent. And the reason that they're consistent is because these are Cepheids in different environments in terms of their metallicity. But one of the nuisance parameters in the distance ladder is the dependence between Cepheid luminosity and metallicity. And so what we find is that there's a, a strong correlation between those two that connects lots of local galaxies, the small Magellanic Cloud, the large Magellanic Cloud, and you see 4258, the Milky Way, even the parallaxes within the Milky Way, those stars have different metallicities, and this gray region you see here is the constraint just internal to the Milky Way, but this does not have much impact on the Hubble constant, and the reason is because the metallicities we measure of the Cepheids in the supernova hosts live within the range of our anchors from the Milky Way to the large Magellanic Cloud. So when you look at the marginal posterior between the metallicity and the Hubble constant, and the baseline here is in gray, this is not driving or changing the Hubble constant. It's just explaining why the different anchors are consistent with each other. So uh, an important null test, I would say, of our overall measurements that I described is to look at the residuals these are binned, but the residuals of the Cepheid measurements from the global fit as a function of the local background of the Cepheids. Now, the local background is not part of the model. It's part of the measurement. So that's why this is a strong test is the model doesn't know anything about the background. And so when we look at the residuals versus the background, we see that they're consistent with zero trend. Now, we do this separately in the supernova hosts in red and in NGC 4258 in black. Now, if we were systematically over or underestimating the background, then you would expect a trend. And the trend that would solve the tension, that would you know, basically show us, oh, you know, our measurements were off enough to explain the tension, would be in the case of the supernova host, it would be to underestimate the background systematically so that we're overestimating the brightness of the Cepheids. And to solve the trend, the data would have to follow the red line here so that it reached about two tenths of a magnitude by the time you get to the mean background. Or alternatively, we could be overestimating the background in the calibrator NGC 4258. So the black points would need to follow the black line here or some combination of the two. And we could strongly rule that out. So it definitely passes the null test here that we're not over or underestimating the background and far from the amount that would be required to solve the tension. And it would be very hard to understand why in one galaxy, the calibrator, you would be systematically misestimating the background. And in the supernova hosts, you wouldn't be doing the same thing, that at least those two would cancel. And so it would be kind of wacky if this went in opposite directions. And then this gets back to uh, where Dan uh, and Dylan worked on the Pantheon part of this. And that is, you know, how do you combine these high redshift supernovae to measure the expansion history of the universe while you're measuring the Hubble constant. So this gets into a way that people might want to use this information instead of just adopting the value of the Hubble constant we get, they could fit it themselves. They could, they could start with the first two rungs of the distance ladder that give us the distances to these hosts of 42 supernovae. And then they can adopt from any standardized supernova data set, but of course Pantheon is a good choice for that the local standardized measurements of those supernovae, as well as the ones in the Hubble flow with their redshifts. And so here, 
you're essentially calibrating the luminosity of the supernovae. At the same time, you're determining the Hubble constant and some arbitrary way of describing the expansion history of the universe. So you could plug into here lambda CDM, you could plug in modified gravity, whatever you want to do that has free parameters. And then you use the covariance matrix of these host distances. You simultaneously solve for H naught, the calibration of supernovae and H of Z. And in this worked example we did here, you could do this in terms of Q naught, the deceleration parameter and H naught. So that gives you the two of these things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Like just to, to summarize maybe what you were saying, it's essentially because if someone has a modified lambda, modification to lambda CDM and they take your H naught equals X plus or minus Y value, it could be that in that modified physics model, your analysis would actually give H naught equals 72 or 74 or some other other value. So they're actually taking the wrong value for their model. That's, it. That's exactly right. If you're, if you're really going to do some radical change, you really want to do this self-consistently. And our H naught had a small correction because it wasn't done at redshift zero. It was really done at redshift like 0.05. And so we already made a small accounting for that with Q naught. Whereas presumably their modification is a cosmological one and they're not actually modifying the uh, the magnitude of the uh, supernovae. That's right, that's right. They're, they're changing the expansion history, they're changing cosmology, they're throwing out the FRW metric, whatever they wanna do, you covered because we can give you the pieces. You're really just solving for this one calibration term, but you're doing that simultaneously to your cosmological model. And I'll just add that we're making these pieces public. So the covariance of host distances and all of the supernova and the supernova covariance are going to be publicly released. We've actually developed the code for this that will be released as well. So people can plug in their own models for the expansion history. And it should be relatively easy for people to plug into this kind of analysis if that's what they're looking to do. And Dylan, are these codes, is this in a format or language that people use it's already been integrated into cosmosis there's a public version of cosmosis out there that people can clone and run and it will be part of the public repository of data that gets given when you use cosmosis right you mean now as in right now or after the papers are accepted in journals and this you really have to read the paper but we've gone through i think a really exhaustive list i really hope we covered everybody's idea or option uh, maybe we haven't but you know if people have a different idea of how they would fit the distance ladder there's a very good chance it's already one of the 67 variants so we can't went through 12 different categories from the baseline different ways you might want to reject outliers uh, different geometric anchors how you relate the colors of cepheids to uh, dust how you fit the period luminosity relationship, how you treat metallicity, uh, if you want to include another distance indicator simultaneously, like tip of the red giant branch, which we do. The changes to the Hubble flow sample, changes to the calibrator sample, go through every supernova survey, excluding them one by one, uh, different supernova fitting. So uh, Dan and uh, Dylan have a new way to standardize type 1a supernovae in the in this kind of salt regimen. But we also we use that, but we also use an older version as well, uh, different maps of peculiar velocities. We're throwing away the near infrared data and just using optical data. And uh, you can move the Hubble constant around a little bit, but it's very difficult to get below about 72 and a half or above about 73 and a half. And in fact, I just pull out here some of my favorites of the uh, ways that people have suggested or just bifurcations. So more tests on the uh, crowding is by splitting the sample in half by, you know, the most crowded half and the least crowded half. You know, some people have posited a local void we live in. So we move beyond where that local void they've posited to be uh, and uh, all kinds of other things. And we don't, we don't see anything that really uh, changes anything, although we include the dispersion of these as a kind of extra systematic. I guess w one thing that in principle to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, you'd want to also know the subsequent error bar on these orange dots. Yeah, it's in the paper. Yeah, in the paper, in the table, there's actually a table of these values and the error bars and their chi-squares. Some of them are just ruled out because they have poor chi-square. Okay, I guess the other thing, when, if one is like putting one's devil's advocate hat on, if there was geometric anchors that pushed it down and TRGB inclusion that pushed it down and only optical CFE data that pushed it down, 
one could in principle take a, a series of one sigma steps, but that that's starting to get very far fetched in terms of um Right. I mean, the problem is, right, if you take things that are that seem to have nothing to do with each other, like you said, uh, uh, I want to take the low point from optical data, I want to take the low point from geometric anchors, and I'm going to grab a low point from TRGB. If these things have nothing to do with each other, then you're not really helping yourself in a statistic sense, because you're taking things that are each, you know, less likely, and then you're saying, what's the likelihood of a bunch of unlikely events? And the answer is even less likely. So... <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess, I mean, this is exactly why people are advocating blind analysis and, and stuff like that, that this is exactly what you shouldn't do, right? You shouldn't do your analysis and then be like, oh, here's five effects that all push it down. I will include them all. I guess the only reason I'm kind of doing that in a devil's advocate kind of way is that this is five sigma and, and there, there are no compelling explanations in terms of astrophysics or in terms of new physics to explain it. Sure. Well, I mean, I don't think, certainly one doesn't want to torture the data or do things that are pathological, I guess I would say, because, you know, you might, you know, when you mentioned, I mean, there are ideas, I think, about what could do this from a cosmological standpoint, like changes to pre-recombination physics that some of them are quite interesting. In fact, there was a recent one, I think the ACT team uh, see some evidence, they said, in, in their new CMB data, maybe some pre-recombination signals like of EDD or things like that. So, you know, I mean, I think you want to make the measurement as best you can and keep that prior separate from the thinking part. This is the error budget that has come down quite a bit over uh, the, the 15 years of this project. So here we are in the sort of current framework. And, you know, it's going to be hard to double the sample again because <laughs> these only go off like once a year. But anyway, our main conclusions then are the, the baseline result and it being five sigma from Planck. So just a quick question. The reason it's gone from 20 odd to 40 odd over the last five years is not obviously that 20 new supernovae have gone on. No, no. We went back and made the observations with, with Hubble. That's right. But, but you followed up the galaxies where previously supernovae had gone off? Right, that's right. The supernova needs to have gone off in the last, you know, 30, 40 years so that there's a good digital record of the light curve. But then, we, you know, we can go back with Hubble and observe the Cepheids any old time. Um, that's what we did more recently. Anyway, so there's the baseline result, which is about five sigma from Planck. There are extra conclusions in the paper, lots of them, but just I'll pull out a few, which is just that the extragalactic Cepheids, when we look in real detail, look like Milky Way Cepheids. The geometric anchors appear consistent. We've done a lot of work on matching the supernovae between rungs two and three, the types of galaxies, the properties, and the surveys. We see consistency between Cepheid and tip of the red giant branch measurements between the same anchor and supernova hosts. Uh, we've done this exhaustive study of systematics, variations, bifurcations. We don't see any indications of some funnies or internal inconsistencies. And we don't know uh, what is causing this. Yeah, yeah. Dan and Dylan, do you have any, any things you're itching to, to add? Yeah, maybe just a couple points. Um, so one kind of about the, the question about blinding. I think what's nice about the distance ladder is there is some separation between kind of the Pantheon Plus side and the shoe side. So like Dylan and I have no idea how things are going to match up to the Cepheids. So like we felt pretty, pretty blind. And like, you know, we, we were trying to do the best we could with supernovae, not knowing kind of, you know, does this match a Cepheid distance? Does this cause an offset or anything like that? And then kind of just to the other point of like, basically you choose all these different variants that can make H-net go down a little bit. I, I used to say this, I don't know, like a few years ago that, you know, yeah, you could flip a coin and maybe get like heads seven times in a row and that's possible. I think what's kind of been amazing to me is like kind of between, you know, like the 2016 analysis and this one, there have been little things that have changed, but they've been small. And what's been amazing is just kind of how robust the final answer is. And even kind of as we've been doing this process, like, you know, the supernova side will realize, I don't know, we're doing something with the, you know, some calibration of some sample, we had something wrong, and just things don't, don't change that much. So it's just been, to me, kind of remarkably robust to the kind of changes that we put in. The, the, the problem with, with what I was suggesting as, when I said I put my devil's advocate hat on is that there were also a bunch of systematic effects you checked that pushed it up by 0.5 sigma. And so it's just completely bad a posterior statistics to say, oh, well, I'm convinced that Planck have completely correct and Lambda Cedium is completely correct. Therefore, I'm going to choose these four systematics that push me down or, or eight or nine or whatever it takes to get down and neglect all the ones that push it up. Right. 
I mean, I, I guess another way I would sort of put my agnostic hat on is just, you know, if it weren't for <laughs> CMB measurements or, or, you know, knowledge from the, the cosmological model, if we were just measuring the Hubble constant locally like people did, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I don't think anybody would question even this. They, they would just go, wow, you guys have really beaten this dead horse. I mean, you know, this is, we don't need to know the Hubble constant that well. I mean, you know, this is extreme, you know, get over it, move on to something else. And so the only reason, you know, that we, we take such a hard look at these things is this difference. And so, you know, this is really an end-to-end -end test of the cosmological model. It hasn't passed uh, so far. And, uh, you know, I don't know what grading is like in, in courses you teach or what Dan or teaches or what Dylan will teach at some point. But, you know, this just doesn't look like a passing grade. And you can try to look, you know, really hard at the, uh, you know, the work that's been turned in and try to make it a pass. But, <laughs> you know, it's really hard. Yeah, although I, I do want to stress for, for anyone who's not a cosmologist who might be stumbling across this video, the extrapolation from the CMB, I mean, H, H naught squared goes as rho so the, the density and the density has dropped by a factor of what 10 to the power of three cubed so h naught has gone by a factor of what 10 to the power of nine halves from cmb to today and i don't think you ever actually quoted the Planck value but it's what it's like 67 is that 67.54 right? plus or minus 0.5 right so so after extrapolating by a factor of 10 to the power of nine halves we're off by by five nine percent it's certainly oh yeah nine percent so it's certainly a big tension that has to be taken seriously but it shows that the 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 model cosmologists they're using is is mostly correct the big bang happened the blah 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 blah. It, it, but there's missing pieces if something's going on i mean i still tend to think it'll be a wrinkle like you said it's not uh oh my gosh uh, nothing is 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 like it seemed it was and if if there is oh my gosh nothing was like how it seemed it was somehow this new thing has to get all the other things right as well that are, that are going on. It has to get this extrapolation down to 67 plus 72 kind of range. Thought. So I guess the, the next normal question I ask is where to next? This 42 supernovae, are there any other that you haven't yet followed up with CIFIDs or is this it? You've, you've kind of got them all now and we just have to wait. So this is a complete sample of all the ones to about Redshift 0.01, which, of which there are 40. And you could try to go further, but then you need sort of a special circumstances, like an extremely luminous galaxy, lots of Hubble time, you know. So you might, you know, try, we're going to try a little bit of that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's as I said, we're, there's no, nobody's going to be doubling this sample anytime soon. It, yeah, so, so where to next for, for shoes then? What, what is this it? Is this the last kind of major result? Well, we have, uh, we have time on JWST. You might have heard of that telescope. Um, it's due to launch in just a few weeks. So if all that goes well, you know, we have follow-up experiments to do with JWST. Um, and, you know, the community is quite poised to uh, follow up in many other ways with LIGO, with uh, new CMB experiments. So some of the ideas about what could explain this tension involve changes in pre-recombination physics that uh, there could be signatures of in the CMB. One, one maybe elephant in the room is this Carnegie Hubble project that also uses TRGBs. They don't get 72 plus or minus 0.99, right? They, they get a smaller value. Is there something you want to say about the differences in... Right. We analyzed that in the paper and included that data. So one of the things we show is there are two groups that have actually measured tip of the red giant branch with a set of supernova hosts. And we show that the Cepheid distances are consistent. In fact, they match perfectly to the TRGB distances when you start and end at the same place. So that allows you to uh, combine them because they are consistent. And then it comes down to, and I talked about some of these different variants, you know, are you including corrections for peculiar velocities? Are you including the calibration of different surveys? And so we provide all those variants. The inclusion of the TRGB data does lower the Hubble constant. In fact, the, the value there is in the upper right. If you use the TRGB data, you're at more like 72 and a half plus or minus 0.99 but it's not a big change in the story. Okay, but the Carnegie group get of order kind of 69, is that right? So, so is that... They get 69.8, and the other TRGB group using the same data gets 71.5, but that's less than a third of the data that we're using here. And even those two results, as we show in the paper, are consistent within the shot noise of the size of the two samples. So there's a piece in there that's just looks like a fluctuation.
Dan and Dylan, do you have any thoughts on, on where to next that Adam hasn't covered? Yeah, we could just say, again, yeah, the supernova side, there's a lot of next steps. So uh, Dylan's mentioned how kind of next month uh, we're hoping to have out our analysis of W and other cosmological parameters. So that's, we have a very immediate next step. But kind of even more than that, this supernova set is now kind of like the largest low redshift sample and we could use them and the kind of peculiar velocities we talked a little about to measure growth of structure so we could weigh in on all the sigma e tension and that'll be really exciting and supernova can be used in in a variety of probes and i think we could really push this sample to weigh in on a number of things so the peculiar velocity growth of structure is that literally just a measurement of the power spectrum of the velocity in some way or is yeah it's a it's, it's, it's a measurement of power spectrum so so basically we're kind of flipping our hubble diagram uh upside down so we we can take the residuals from our hubble diagram to try to infer what the peculiar velocities are and from those try to understand the kind of the matter in our local universe cool wow that, that that's quite exciting there's also going to be an improvement in the equation of state of dark energy coming from the Pantheon side. Maybe these guys will say more about how much of an improvement. Our sample going all the way out to redshift 2 hasn't quite doubled. It's gone from 1,000 to 1,700. But the figure of merit on our cosmological constraints is going to go up by a factor of 2.2, we believe. So a lot of that comes from a lot of methodological improvements, improvements to systematics, not just statistical improvements. So it's been a lot of work on that front, but it's exciting for what we'll see for cosmology very soon. Okay. Before I ask the final question, I'm going to ask a question that might be very annoying to you and feel free not to answer it, but a kind of twofold question. One, if you had to gamble, what would you gamble on the solution to the Hubble tension turning out to be? And then a follow-up question, if you absolutely had to say what it might be in shoes that is still residual somewhere that just might be the effect what would you say it was i mean maybe that second one you're less keen to answer because you've just analyzed 67 possibilities and presumably they were the 67 most likely so you might just have literally no idea for the second one so if i had to gamble and i do like to gamble i have always said to myself like you know we did this analysis in 2016 and you know, maybe there's some things that we could have done better and like kind of the next really big one, then I would like be personally completely convinced. And, you know, we've done it now and I feel just kind of completely convinced. So I don't think it's, it's a problem on the shoes side. I think this early dark energy stuff is really interesting and things have moved from like kind of maybe some disagreements in the late universe measurements to now some disagreements between ACT and Planck and I am extremely curious about that. To answer your second question, like if there could be anything wrong, I really think that we've kind of ruled out any normal thing that anyone could think about. And at this point, it's kind of the crazy stuff of like some very non-Copernican astrophysics. So if for some reason something is changing at some specific distance, you have to concoct some wild things, but that's actually what's going on in the literature right now where people are saying, just at this distance, then suddenly these objects turn into different kinds of objects. I see. So, so it's kind of not cosmological, but almost fundamental particle physics, kind of like supernovae just explode in different ways over time. Yeah, or it's even like things are different over there than over here kind of a thing that, you know, we used to just call the cosmological principle. Now we would just say, boy, that's a long way to go to solve this problem is <laughs> to make the universe different further away from us than nearby. You know, I, you know, I would answer the second one. Uh, I would just sort of say, like, as you said, we went through this paper. I mean, I think we went through the top, I'm going to say 67 variants and I'm out of ideas, but I, I sort of agree with what Dan said is if it's something on that side, it's something very pathological, like, uh, yeah, that, you know, that's like, you know, th this is, I think the face value interpretation and more of, you know, this measurement. And also there are many, I would say, other measurements from the local universe. I mean, shoes in this way is not a, an outlier. It's kind of living in the, in the middle of a distribution of late universe measurements between around 70 and 75. You know, we don't see people in the late universe or local Hubble constant measurement that are precise measurements, but that are coming in below the Planck value. Yeah, and, and I guess even if their error bars are, are kind of individually consistent with Planck, it's still suspicious that all of them are above Planck. You called out the lowest value of the late universe measurement, the CCHP groups measure of TRGB, and that's the lowest one. 
And so how come everything is, is above Planck? That's weird. As a supernova person, and I, I like to hang my hat on the fact that you, you often hear shoes is like the supernova H naught measurement. Well, in a sense, that's true, but but supernova, you can get an H naught other ways from supernovae, like the inverse distance ladder or using their constraint on omega matter and combining with other probes. So from the supernova side, we we like to think that there's not an easy solution that fits all of those different ways of getting all these different H naughts. So we tend to look elsewhere for, for ways to solve this. Well, not only that, I would add, you know, that at the end of the day, and we did this in 2016, we'll do this again, you know, we release all the basic photometry of the Cepheids and the supernovae. So other people have taken this data and tried things as well, and they're, they're free to do that. I don't think there's been any, any solutions or compelling results. Almost all of them have really come in around the same answer, so. Cool, okay, so then the more um, answerable question, what work being done in cosmology at the moment do you think is particularly underappreciated by the community as a whole? I'm going to answer uh, particle experiments like neutrino experiment, because, you know, if something is going to come out of left field and just solve this, it's going to be something like that, where neutrino experiments, and there's been clues and hints that are interesting, will say, you know, there is a, a sterile neutrino or there are neutrino interactions like this, and they'll have these cosmological implications. And some of those, there's been a couple of false alarms on those, but, you know, some of those could solve the Hubble tension just like that, like, meaning they would find strong evidence of that and, and we, it would just have to become factored into the cosmological model. And we might say, oh, well, we're, we're done with our part now. So, so, yeah, just to maybe clarify for people, I guess, what you would be meaning there is that like the, the expansion rate today probably would be 73, but because the neutrinos existed in the early universe, they've changed the extrapolation from the CMB to today that, that the CMB is actually predicting 73. Correct. And Dan, any thoughts? I want to tie something back to something Adam said at the beginning, which is that I feel like our community is very oriented towards kind of the next big experiment or something that's going to launch in five years or 10 years. And what's kind of always surprising is the lifetime and utility of samples and analyses that are published and clean and cared after. They just kind of last way longer than I feel like people think when they put them out and are become really valuable to the community. So yeah, I kind of always w wish like people would, would recognize and appreciate more that these things that have come out and aren't just kind of stopped being taken care of when they're released, but kind of after are, are really valuable for the community. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified of new videos and click like to help with YouTube algorithms and all of that and share the channel with the colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. I suppose if you want to know more about Cepheid crowding, Adam gave a video about that more than 12 months ago. There's a bunch of possible solutions to the Hubble tension that have been talked about. I won't isolate any specific one, but if you scan through, you'll, you'll see them. And other than that, thanks, Dylan. Adam and Dan for the great talk. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Have a good night. Yep. Thanks for having us.